Welcome to this virtual event hosted by Citizens Committee for Children of New York and organized as part of Open Data Week 2021. My name is Jack Mullen and I'm a research associate at Citizens Committee for Children or CCC. And I'll be leading today's session and relying on the support of my colleagues, Maria Drobniak, who's a senior research associate for data resources and Alice Bofkin, who is director of policy for child and adolescent health. Today's event is titled Measuring the Digital Divide an Open Data Guide. And it's the aim of today's session to leave you all with information on the digital divide in New York City, to share resources, to identify impacted communities and to elevate local solutions to make the internet a universal public good. Here's what the program is going to look like. Very quickly, I'll tell you what CCC is all about. Then I want to dig into a few slides of data that will set the table for a discussion on the digital divide and its impact on New Yorkers across the city. We'll then break into a few groups for a brief exercise exploring the New York City open data portal to search for data sets that are relevant to this conversation. And then I want us to come back uh, with a conclusion on resources to overcome the digital divide and policy solutions at the local, state, and federal level. So I know a few people here will already know, but for the uninitiated, Citizens Committee for Children in New York is a 75-year-old nonprofit with a mission to ensure that every New York child is healthy, housed, educated, and safe. We do this work with a mixture of data and research, policy campaigns and coalitions, and civic engagement to bring together New Yorkers uh, to make the city a better place for children. So obviously, internet access has come into our sphere of advocacy only in the last decade or so. But when it comes to tackling a subject like the digital divide, I'd say that CCC has really been at the forefront of efforts to collect and analyze data on this issue from even prior to COVID-19. Every year, we collect and produce estimates of internet access in New York City uh, using the American Community Survey. This is a survey that reaches 50,000 uh, New York City households annually and can help us answer these questions on is internet access universal? Uh, if a household is accessing internet, is it through a high-speed broadband plan or just from a cellular data plan? And what other devices exist in the home for people to access the internet from? And then more recently, uh, CCC looked at data included in this report from the mayor's technology officer, uh, which was actually compiled by the mayor's office of data analytics, so shout out to Moda. Uh, the data capture the infrastructure of internet service providers or ISPs by neighborhood. And this is useful because there's a general threshold or principle that having at least three ISPs is the minimum necessary to avoid obviously a monopoly or a duopoly uh, that has consequences for the quality of services in an area. So most of the data I'm about to share is also available on our public interactive database data.cccnewyork.org, which I'll point to later on as well. So what do these sources tell us? Well, the key fact of the matter is that approximately half a million New York City households are without internet access. That is no dial-up, broadband, satellite, or cellular data plans. Citywide, this number accounts for about 15% of all households. So we can see that in certain communities, a lack of internet access affects as many as a quarter to a third of all households. And this is the case in the darker blue shaded areas of the map on the right, you'll see like Borough Park and Brownsville in Brooklyn, the Lower East Side and East Harlem and Manhattan, and areas in the South Bronx uh, like Mott Haven and Hunts Point. <clears throat> in recent years, the city has improved the overall rate of internet access. As I said, 15% lacked internet in total in 2019. That's down from 23% in 2015. But there remains a lot of progress to be made, especially among low-income households. In 2019, uh, we, when we break down internet access by household income levels, we found that in 2019, more than one in three households earning less than $20,000 annually were without internet. And that's compared to just 5% households that make $75,000 more. So these figures tell us about those lacking internet. Another aspect of the digital landscape is the method through which households do access the internet. And one dimension of this that is increasingly prevalent are what we call cell-only households, or homes for which a cellular data plan is the only means of internet access. This was the case for 400,000, or about one in eight households in New York City in 2019. And you can see, again, in as many as one in five areas are cell-only in places like Flushing and Amherst, Corona and Queens, um, as many as 26% in Jamaica, St. Albans, Queens, as well as in uh, northern parts of the Bronx, like Williamsbridge and Bedford Park. Um, overall, uh, it's about one in eight, as I said. Um, and using cellular data plan is not necessarily a problem to access the internet. In fact, it may be more affordable or accessible for many families. But of course, households without a broadband plan are less likely to have a device like a laptop or an iPad or whatever uh, to carry out remote work or learning from home. And Wi-Fi hotspots that are generated by cell phones do not always provide the level of quality for kids' remote learning 
or adults working from home for that matter. So we've considered households without internet and those that rely exclusively on cellular data plans. What about homes with broadband and the quality and availability of internet services for connected households? So this is where the data from uh, the Federal Communications Commission that was compiled by MODA comes in and we mapped the share of competition among internet service providers or ISPs across neighborhoods. Generally, ISPs are universally available in New York City. Uh, that is like each household has at least one uh, provider available, but some areas of the city have significantly limited choice. So the map on the left here shows the share of households with just one ISP. And in Washington Heights in Northern Manhattan, uh, as well as these darker shaded areas like University Heights and Co-op City in the Bronx, is a majority, so 56% to up to 90% of homes in these areas have just one provider available for broadband. This is obviously different than lacking internet entirely, but can still present its own obstacles if a lack of competition among providers is resulting in lower quality of internet services in these areas. So as I said, there are different dimensions to the digital divide. There's the 400,000 households that are relying only on cellular data plans, there's 450 households with just one ISP available, and there's close to 500,000 households that lack internet altogether. That was as of 2019. So these numbers really put it plain just how so many New Yorkers were left unprepared and in the dark once the pandemic hit and really brought the digital realm to the fore. So I want us to think now about how the last year has had really a uniquely damaging impact on populations that lack internet. And I want to close with some statistics on who is living in these homes without internet. So of most interest to CCC's advocacy are children. 185,000 children of school age, that's between the ages of 5 to 17, uh, live in households without high-speed broadband. This is obviously a crucial piece of infrastructure for remote learning. Um, of those without broadband, about half are living in homes that access internet via cellular data. So that leaves 90,000 school-aged children with no internet access at all. Another 75,000 uh, in this age range have internet, but lack adequate devices to learn from. That is, they did not report having a laptop, tablet, or computer in the home. These are using data from the American Community Survey. Um, another aspect we can dig, dig into using the ACS is uh, the characteristics of people living in homes without internet, particularly those who are eligible for safety net programs like uh, food stamps, cash assistance, and Medicaid. So <clears throat> again, in 2019, of the people who reported living in households without internet, more than 100,000 reported also receiving uh, the program Tem Temporary Aid for Needy Families, TANF, or cash assistance. Uh, more than 300,000 New Yorkers lived in households without internet and also received food stamps or SNAP benefits in 2019. And more than 400,000 uh, New Yorkers who live in households without internet were also enrolled in Medicaid or some other low-income plan. Why are these data facts important? Well, this means that the population most in need of anti-poverty supports may face may be facing greater difficulties in accessing needed services because of the current digital divide. This is an issue that my colleague Alice Buckin can definitely speak to later in the policy discussion too. Finally, I want us to consider not just how these digital barriers uh, may have failed people during the pandemic, but also how these barriers are preventing New York from fundamentally escaping it too. Because right now, obviously, there's this great news of multiple safe and effective vaccines ready to go, which the city has planned to distribute to the most vulnerable populations in those communities most harmed by the virus. But that plan is very much dependent on digital equity. And really when an internet connection is practically a requirement to make a vaccine appointment, you're leaving hundreds of thousands of seniors without internet out of the picture. So about one in four New Yorkers uh, age 65 and older in the senior population lacks internet, uh, but these are disproportionately black and Hispanic Latino. It's 25% of black seniors and 30% 30, 30 of those who identify as Hispanic Latino uh, who are seniors lack internet at home as compared to just about 20% of white and Asian seniors. So right now this talk of reaching equity in vaccine distribution is really only achievable when we reach equity in access to digital life and the internet. So whether it's students who are trying to learn, remote, uh, learn remotely, uh, adults who are trying to enroll in needed support programs, or even seniors trying to get a shot, these data really make it clear that internet access is an essential public good in today's world. So as I said earlier, if these data spark your interest, you're very much welcome to dig into the facts from our public database at data.cccnewyork.org, where you'll find hundreds more indicators of well-being for children and families. Thank you, Jack. My name is Alice Buckin, and I am Director of Policy for Child and Adolescent Health at CCC. Today, I'll be sharing information on the implications of the lack of internet access on the lives of New York City families. In the landscape of local, state, and national policy, 
related to closing the digital divide. Before we get into more local proposals, I want to talk about some of the big picture approaches to closing the digital digital divide. It's a that's a tongue twister. So I think what has become you know abundantly clear, I think you all know in your own work, is that internet access is not a luxury. It is a necessity today. It should be available to everyone who needs it. Um, but there's a lot of debate around how we get there. Of course, one of the major challenges with how things operate now is that the internet service providers who offer internet are still businesses and their bottom line is still making a profit. And that's a major reason why we don't see broadband everywhere, including in rural communities or in communities where it's harder to you know, get broadband um, in those spaces um, because it's often not profitable. And without sort of external motivation, um, we often don't see that there's a, an equitable access to, to internet services throughout the city and the state. So we've seen a lot of low cost and, and free plans during the pandemic, which has been great. But a lot of those sort of offers have been, you know, fading now that uh, we're further along in the pandemic. And that really hasn't really been a permanent solution to addressing some of these really deep seated inequities. So one approach is to develop pr public private partnerships with ISPs or internet service providers to increase broadband access. And that's actually something that Mayor de Blasio is uh, really working on. And, and we actually just saw this past week or two an announcement of a couple of initiatives that he is pushing. Part of his plan has has been $157 million capital investment to contract with multiple ISPs to try to fill some of these gaps within the city where um, we don't see access. So really using existing real estate and municipal buildings in order to facilitate that expansion. And we also know that only, again, this past week, he announced that there's been additional investment to build out about 7,500 city street poles that would allow for more mobile carriers to have um, the ability to build out their, their 5G networks, especially in underserved areas. So, you know, this is this is one approach, which is really saying, let's let's combine sort of the, the public resources we have and the, the incentives in providing contracts to, you know, private uh, ISPs and, and providers in that space. The other sort of major component, of course, in ensuring access is in subsidizing uh, access to services. So access, as you know, Jack has really pointed out, is not the only piece. It, even if we had, you know, enough ISPs in every space within the city or within the state, we still have to deal with the issue of affordability. And the reality is that, uh, you know, high quality internet services is unaffordable to many, many, many New Yorkers. And so any solution really does uh, have to involve some opportunity to identify low-income individuals and low-income families and make sure that they receive the support that they need, um, not only that the network is there, but they have the ability to afford the kind of internet services that are really necessary for, for, for operating and, and sort of existing right now. And then another approach that is sort of on the other side that's, that's, that's uh, moving away from sort of the, the reliance on, on the private industries is the idea of a public or municipal model of broadband. And the idea behind that is essentially the local government would run services essentially like a, a public utility. And the advantages to this are in theory that the city can sort of directly provide access to free of charge uh, internet where it's needed in places like, you know, NYCHA housing or city shelters or public schools, and it would have control and oversight of that system. So in theory, would also be able to provide lower costs and ensure greater privacy um, and, uh, you know, net neutrality and some of those issues there. So unfortunately, it would be a much larger discussion for us to get into sort of the, the these sort of proposals, as well as many others that are out there at ways to approach this. But I wanted to at least sort of flag these and raise these with you um, as some of the different sort of combinations of proposals that are out there on how do we address this really deep-seated issue and access to, to high-speed quality internet. So sort of following that, I want to then jump into talking about some of the really specific recent um, proposals and investments that have happened at the federal, state, and city level, um, as well as a lot of those issues that are, are clearly still lacking um, at all levels of government. So Jack, if you want to pop to the next slide. So in recent months, there have been a number of, of uh, proposals that have been implemented at, this, at the federal level. I only flagged two of them here, but one was something called the Emergency Broadband Internet Program, and that was occurred in December. And it included things like up to $50 a month for eligible low-income households and a one-time reimbursement option for of $100 for purchasing different devices. But of course, you know, the challenges around that are that one, that funding was not directly given to individuals. It was really passed through the um, uh, through the broadband providers, um, at least for the devices that had a copay for certain incomes, and, and providing this really wasn't mandatory. So, so while this was was certainly beneficial to to a number of folks throughout the the country, it's not exactly sort of a broad and expansive approach to to the the real deep seated gaps we have. Um, the most recent federal proposal is is very recent, as in you all may have just seen that President Biden just signed the new stimulus package um, today, and as part of that, one piece of it was um, about uh, seven. $1.6 billion for an emergency connectivity fund. 
Um, and what that is intended to do is provide um, funds for internet services, hotspots, and devices um, to help schools and libraries connect students to virtual learning. It's estimated to connect more than 15 million children and 400,000 uh, teachers um, to uh, the services that they need. And so that's, you know, we don't yet know, of course, how the breakdown will be in terms of how much of that goes to each state, how much will come to New York. But we're very hopeful that with that funding, we can see a real investment at the state level to increase our ability to sort of reach more, more students and teachers and in overall sort of increase uh, access to, to um, internet services. Next, I want to turn to some of the, the state considerations. You know, we know that, you know, th you know, we've talked at length about how challenging uh, it has been for students, for everyone, um, but including students to, uh, to access school services. Um, we've seen schools around the state have really creative solutions um, to get internet. We've seen them, you know, work to get devices to students to form partnerships with local ISPs. Um, the governor has also made some proposals to require ISPs to offer more affordable plans, although we actually haven't seen uh, that that is that is not law and we haven't actually haven't seen any funding behind some of those proposals. Um, and we've also seen, you know, philanthropic efforts to support families who can't afford Internet. But of course, that is not a sustainable approach to to sort of a long term issue. And we know that there are so many uh, households throughout the state and throughout the city who, who lack Internet access. So I want to highlight a few areas where it's, it's really important for us to look if we want to begin approaching and, and trying to combat. Um, the digital divide at the state level. So one of those areas is very relevant to this uh, presentation Jack has been doing, which is that we need more accurate data and maps on internet coverage. So currently, um, when reporting coverage areas to the Federal Communications Commission, broadband providers can indicate that an entire census block has service even when only a single household when that, that block has broadband access. So as you can imagine, that is not an accurate uh, picture of, of, you know, households actually having access. It just means that maybe some folks within that census tract do. And so that can make a real challenge when we're trying to really identify which neighborhoods and communities are, are particularly lacking in access. The New York State Legislature did pass uh, something called the Comprehensive Broadband Connectivity Act, which would have required a lot more data collection on broadband access and affordability um, and sort of more accurate service maps. Unfortunately, that was pocket vetoed by the governor, which, you know, essentially was sort of let it was allowed to die and so it did not pass. Um, but it does give us some um, thoughts on, on what we could look to, to to increase the ability to, to really measure um, what the digital divide looks like for, for families on the ground. The other piece that we need to do is really just invest in broadband um, and ensure broadband access. It is, it is not a cheap thing to do, but it is a necessity. Again, we need to be finding ways to make sure that everyone has access to a, a reliable network. And so significant investments are needed so that every household and every space without high-speed broadband um, has the opportunity to access it. Um, but of course, it's not just about access, as I said before, it's also about affordability. So this sort of needs to go hand in hand with making sure that in addition to having the network there, that actually accessing that is affordable. And that, you know, a, a sort of at least a stopgap measure for that is making sure that we have subsidies available for low income um, individuals and families um, who, who cannot currently afford um, uh, the, the, op the options available to them. The other piece that I think was raised uh, at the beginning of this was the importance of, of digital training and technical assistance for students, for teachers, for providers. Um, it's often not just the people receiving services, whether it's health services or, or education instruction or social services, a lot of times providers don't have the training that they necessarily need. They, they would never have received training for how do you how do you switch from providing something that was so in person to suddenly having to learn how to do it through all these new platforms um, that may, they may not be familiar with. So there's a real need to invest um, in, in, um, in that sort of uh, technical assistance and training um, for, for all sorts of folks throughout the state. A part of it, again, very familiar would be the importance of investing devices for schools, for libraries, for health and human services providers. You know, I certainly, I'll talk about this more at the city discussion, but it is abundantly clear that too many households are still missing a device, number one, enough devices for the household, reliable devices, that they're getting their devices fixed if something goes wrong with them. And also things that aren't just about a device, they're about things like headphones. Because when you think about a family that might have several children in it, might have a parent who's working, might have all sorts of things going on, if you have you know, six people in a small space trying to to have six different conversations, that's not a good environment for anybody. And so even something like that, like headphones or, or ways to really think through what are these other ways that we can make things easier for, for people when they're trying to access services. The other piece is in uh, banning caps on data from internet service providers. So again, when you're using 
you know, the internet for school, if you're using it for talking to family, if you're using it for, you know, um, you know, getting healthcare services, whatever it is, um, we really can't be slowing things down um, when we're trying to, when folks are trying to access these, these essential services. And the last piece I want to touch on is, is really specific to sort of telehealth and telehealth inequities. For all the challenges we've seen, we really have seen new opportunities arise around reaching people um, through telehealth uh, if they if they have the ability to access it. So, for instance, families who might struggle to go into an appointment because they don't have childcare or transportation is too difficult or they can't get away from work, um, telehealth really does open up opportunities to reach more people in that way. It's very reliant on a someone having access to the ability to connect. And then B, having the ability um, to, to receive those services, um, you know, even if they do have connectivity. So earlier in this discussion, it was raised the issue of young children, a lot of the specific challenges in providing new services to young children. And there are lots of populations like that, where even if tomorrow we snapped our fingers and we had, you know, uh, broadband networks that were reliable and everyone could afford it, we'd still have populations that would need additional assistance. So if you think about um, English language learners, if we don't offer services and platforms in, in appropriate languages, there's no access. If you think about individuals with disabilities, if we don't have platforms that are designed to support them, that's not access. That's not equitable access. Uh, if you think about the needs of LGBTQ youth who may not have the privacy they need in, a, in their home potentially, and so how do we how do we figure out solutions to make sure that they can get, if, if they're seeking therapy, um, that they're not feeling alienated in the home that they're in. And then we also have a lot of you know, issues around historic racism in the healthcare system broadly and how that translates to sort of this new mode of service delivery and, and telehealth coming into the home. Um, so these are all issues that are complicated, they're complex, and they're not a one solution fits all. What they do require is real careful attention to what individual communities are experiencing and listening to communities on the ground. And I'll, I'll reiterate that in the city section, but you know, I, th I think it's very important that as the state is, you know, the, the ship has sailed on telehealth. We, this is the direction we're going. So careful attention must be made to make sure that we have equitable access to telehealth services going forward. And then Jackie, yeah, jumping to the city issues, uh, it's a lot of similar issues. So I won't touch on, on some of the ones that overlap too much, but you know, we have seen the, the city of New York do, do a pretty Herculean effort to try to get devices out to students. You know, hundreds of thousands of devices have been given to students, um, but we know tens of thousands of students still don't have them as, as Jack laid out in his presentation. So a lot of work needs to be done. Um, you know, we still have children who have gone months without participating in school regularly or at all. They simply haven't been engaged in school for four months, five months, six months. And those are the children, as I said earlier, we need to find and we need to reconnect to service. In terms of some of the new things that are coming out of the city, um, there were a couple of uh, announcements um, that, that came out. I mentioned earlier that the, the mayor um, has, has announced a, a new request for proposal around um, engaging um, providers in um, uh, providing more affordable plans um, and reaching uh, new parts of the city, as well as the issue around, you know, uh, introducing 5G through through more um, polls throughout the, the city. Um, and he also recently, again, just this past week, announced um, that there's a new public-private partnership allowing the city to install Wi-Fi and broadband upgrades in 50 community centers and buildings and NYCHA complexes. Um, so these are all uh, locations that host students on the remote learning days in learning labs or offer childcare in NYCHA's Cornerstone Youth Program. So these are, you know, all really great steps, really great investments. Um, but we know, um, you know, these are, these steps have to be built on tenfold, a hundredfold. And, and one of those areas that we see that we're most concerned about is, is children who are in shelters and individuals in shelters generally. And, you know, there has been a, a growing effort from the city to, to sort of react to a lot of pushback and, and pointing out that it's been about a year of this pandemic and there are many, many shelters that still have no internet access. So that means that you may have not only a child who can't access learning, but you have parents who can't access, um, you know, housing supports, who can't can't connect to a job because there's that's how things are done now is through the internet. Who can't access social services that they would need because they have no internet access. So you know we join a lot of other advocates and saying these shelters need to be prioritized. We also know that you know things like you know children who are in foster care who who you know a lot of their ways of communicating with their families have been disrupted or children in congregate care settings, children in detention facilities um, who who you know we hear stories in Rikers of um, you know not being able to do video conferencing. These are all issues and and, and uh, uh, particularly vulnerable children that we don't want overlooked um, in, in sort of a, a a attempts to address a lot of these challenges in, in access. Um, and so again, much like with the state, um, the city also needs to increase digital literacy and streamline technical assistance. You know, we hear all the time from provider partners about children who are disconnected from 
school for weeks because their devices aren't working, they don't know who to go to, and they can't get help. And so they are just sitting there for weeks because there's no easy way for them to know how and, and where to go to get those devices fixed. And so I think all this brings back to that final issue that I raised earlier, which is the importance of engaging communities and solutions. Because a lot of these, these issues that aren't just the big ticket items of, you know, we need to increase broadband, we need to subsidize access, are often overlooked at the state and city level if they're not hearing from people on the ground and if they don't have good mechanisms for hearing from folks raising issues that they're seeing and that really have to be addressed at the city and the state level. So, you know, we, we have continued to really argue that the city and the state need to have mechanisms for getting input from communities and responding rapidly to these issues that are popping up all the time and aren't going to stop anytime soon because this is not, this is not a, a COVID-19 issue. This is an issue that existed well before COVID and COVID just brought further to the surface. So I will stop there. Um,